evening, good afternoon. Um, first, let me do my declaration. I am primarily a clinician, so you have to follow me slowly. All right. I work with a team, Frederick Hickling, Hillary Hickling, who is no stranger to us all. Um, Vanessa Paisley, Ishtar Govai, another psychologist, and my mental health nurse, Karen Grant White, who I will speak about a little later on in the presentation. Now, sorry, Vikram, to bring it up again. <laughs> it must be difficult. But we are here because of the article in Nature, The Grand Challenges of Global Mental Health, which has raised a debate among the psychiatric community. I think that's nice, you know. And some of the issues that are, have been brought up is really about the exclusivity of the process, but the apparent uh, attempt to generalize the product. Other issues that the picture of a black girl chained to a tree gives a biased visual message that human rights violations are confined to non-Western countries. But mental health services worldwide has been fertile ground for human rights violations, especially in the developed world. And it has been one of the forces leading the changes in mental health. When you look at the development of community mental health psychiatry, looking at the Madison community model, which has been reproduced and validated experimentally throughout the developed world, and the development of the principles of community psychiatry from Kaplan and Kaplan, providing care in the patient's community, in their homes, uh, in a geographic location with a multidisciplinary team, but the focus has always been on continuity of care and follow-up care. This model itself has been criticized, so I would say to you, take heart. Usually everything draws debate, and that's good. <clears throat> and it's criticized about the clinical efficacy and the cost efficacy and the fact that it doesn't address the social inclusion or the empowerment issues for the patients on a whole. Despite this, there's been a rush to develop community psychiatry in developing countries. And this has been the source of worldwide collaborative efforts from the developed world to provide mental health services for the developing world. However, it has been established that the cultural <laughs> context of the developing world is profoundly different from that of the developed world. And really, is it that community psychiatry in the developing world is really a misnomer? And should it be replaced by primary care psychiatry? Fred Hicklin has a wealth of experience working in the developed world and in the traditional community mental health model working in New Zealand and then in Birmingham. Britain, as he so eloquently put it, <laughs> is the second largest Caribbean island with 1.5 million African Caribbeans. And so, <laughs> what can I say? And he was in charge of providing care for a, a group or a patch in Aston community. Now, he took heed from a caution that was, was quoted by from Lam that says that we must let what we learn from our clinical experience with our patients determine our ideology rather than the other way around. And so in his work in Birmingham, he used his clinical experience to merge the community engagement model in 1996 with the North Birmingham Mental Health Trust strategies in his creation of the community mental health teams and the AOR teams within his patch. And he found that he had successful treatment of patients within that era when compared to the other strategies. And what was the basic difference? The basic difference was to shift the locus of power from the community team and the legal structure being against the patient to the community team and the patient working together. The legal structure does not shift. So you have the section where the patient has to be involuntarily treated, but the psychiatrist or the team works out a negotiation process with the patient to subvert or to go around the legal section so that they can be treated voluntarily. Now let's look at the Jamaican picture. Jamaica is a small island in the west, it's, it's on the equator, so I don't know where it's north or south, but we're somewhere in the middle. <laughs> but we're poor, let's state that. And we have a population of 2.8 million people. The services that have developed in Jamaica in terms of deinstitutionalization and community development have been described both in academic journals as well as clinical service delivery reports. Now what we're trying to describe is the primary care psychiatry model that has emerged in Jamaica over the past 40 years and that challenges many of the aspects of the prevailing developed world community psychiatry ethos. First phase, the deinstitutionalized process was a collaborative effort between the University of the West Indies and the Ministry of Health um, academics. 
It was supported and recommended by PAHO, so there was some level of globalized involvement. And it started first with a strict catchment area for the mental hospital, which is the only one in the country. And it was restricted to the Kingston and St. Andrew area, which had a population of 700,000, while the other areas had a population of 2 million. Within two years, you saw a dramatic decrease in admissions to the mental hospital. Now, the strict catchmenting of the mental hospital saw a dichotomy developing between rural community services and urban services. And the, the urban services developed in a traditional way, where you had admissions still predominantly being through the mental hospital, and the community service served as a way of ensuring follow-up compliance. Whereas in the community model, patients were admitted and treated and open general medical wards. There was no such thing in that era legally as um, involuntary certification because you could only do that in the mental hospital. Length of stay was much shorter. There was no facility for medium or long-term stay. So getting the patients admitted, the focus had to be on getting them back into their communities and then treating them from there. But surprisingly, the issue of revolving door admissions were far fewer. And all the clinics that <coughs> happened in the rural areas were integrated into primary care, all clinics. In the urban setting, the largest community mental health clinic in Kingston at the time was actually at the mental hospital. That was the largest community mental health clinic with a few others scattered around. The primary care physicians and facilities were integral in, develop, in um, delivering care in the, in the rural model. But there was no inter, interrelationship between the, that in the urban setting. And so you see stigma was minimized because there was constant contact with the persons there. And it remained high in the, in the urban setting. And we had maximal community engagement because it was essential. And it was very minimal in the urban setting. So how did the integration start? First. There was the deployment of nurses, and you'll see the distribution of the parishes, and it's not the religious parishes, it's geographic. And one nurse was sent to each parish, with three psychiatrists sent to cover three parishes, which is what we call a region. So they had to build the teams, because there was no team, it was just an individual. And so the mental health officer, in the middle, worked with the physicians from primary care, there's a primary care physician, a primary care nurse, and the doctors from secondary care, general hospital surgeon, general hospital matron, under the guise of a third of the psychiatrists because they had to cover not just one team, but three teams in three parishes. So that was how it was developed. And the mental health officers were integral in the process of forming the link between the psychiatrists and the primary care and the secondary care physicians. And so you had patients now being admitted and treated on the general medical wards with superior outcomes, not just to the asylum or the mental hospital, but also superior to discrete mental health units or mental wards on general hospitals. <clears throat> so what we are hoping to describe in this presentation is the community engagement model and to show using qualitative and quantitative data from recent work how this model with contrasts with the, the conventional model from the developed world. <clears throat> the mental hospital as it stands now has been cut down to about 700 beds, 600 of which are for destitute patients that are over the age of 65. Yet still, the mental hospital still contains or has two-thirds of the mental health budget for the island. <clears throat> now, the community team in the urban setting at the Bellevue Hospital has always been located on the premises of the mental hospital. So that's where the community team was based. That's where the community clinic was based. It has always been the property of the mental hospital. And they served that restricted catchment area. In 2010, a major development took place. And what we saw was the primary care service created an independent community mental health team. See me? First was the employment of a full-time psychiatrist that was employed strictly to community care. I have no hospital base. I have no safety. <laughs> and the public health nurse and the public 
health physicians are now in charge of primary care. And they have been pivotal in establishing the community health team within the primary health care service in Kingston and St. Andrew. And so that's the primary care team. And that lady, Karen Grant White, is the first nurse practitioner, mental health nurse practitioner, that has not been trained through the mental hospital system. And she was the first unemployed to KSA, Kingston and St. Andrew Health Department. The mental health team from the mental hospital now has been merged and taken over by the primary health care community mental service to form one newly formed primary care community team. And if you look at the, the, the issues of changing the, 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 the philosophy, you're talking about a team that is used to 80% of hospital admissions to Bellevue being involuntary. They're shifting in thinking now to be more in line with the rural setting where less than 8% of patients are involuntarily admitted. But we work together and we have seen tremendous results. What has been shown is that within 2010 to 2011, and I took over in November, what you've seen is a threefold reduction for admissions to the mental hospital by the community mental health team. It's proposed now to change the mental hospital into a general hospital and then thus even further working on the business of, of um, integration. Now let's look at the, the case studies that challenge the involuntary incarceration team. All right, this is a 31-year-old Jamaican male, African descent, with a three-year history of schizophrenia and cannabis abuse. He has had four prior admissions over those three years, and he does not take his medication. He's violent and aggressive, and he has had contact with the community team in the past, but it's always been about forcibly restraining and involuntary certifying him into the mental hospital. He's attacked and injured a nurse on several occasions, and he lives in a vol volatile inner city garrison community that is, has a long history of poverty and gang violence. Now, when the new team engaged, the hostile reaction didn't just come from the patient, but also came from the community. Community groups, one of the groups said, nothing is wrong with him, or not not do him, left the youth alone. Nothing is wrong with him, leave him alone. Other groups said, no, we're going to stop, come here. We're going to just come here, come provoke the youth, which is... All you're doing is provoking him. We will stop you from coming into this area, right? Because when we leave, they're the ones that have to deal with the consequences. And still another group said that, you better look after him, you know, because if he come near or touch you, we're going to kill him. You better treat him, because if he comes near to us or touches us, we're going to kill him, and this is not an idle threat. <laughs> so, faced with this, the team formulated a community engagement plan that they call Community Bliss designed to educate and unite the community members with the patient. Now, they visited the Don of the area, and we'll talk about this a little later, and they formulated a cultural therapy program for the community and the patient. Cultural therapy evolved, actually, I mean, <laughs> controversially from the Bellevue Hospital itself, it, which is a contradiction. And it came out of work that Fred Hicklin had done in the 70s using culture and the arts to engage mentally ill patients with their communities. And it has been recorded and shown that it improved the patient's empowerment and the social engagement that the patient had with their families and the communities. So, in a tent with a stage specially erected for the purpose, the team and the community stage a community cultural therapy program. Engaging with the community in this inner city garrison was a pivotal ingredient in management of this hostile, decompensated, psychotic patient who was not just a danger to himself but to the community at large. The community were demonstrated their willingness to participate in the patient's care after and agreed to ensure that the patient continued to take his medication and keep his follow-up clinics. Involuntary certification practices engendered hostility not just in the patient but in the community and it failed to provide a platform for successful medication and follow-up with clinic compliance. The newly formed primary care-based team have reduced involuntary admissions to the Bellevue Hospital. And when you look at the, the model that Hickling devised of the five-step model, what we have done is to use a, the identical model now in conjunction with the legal section in Jamaica, which does exist. And this is a poem that was actually written by one of my nurses. And she started to perform it. My heart is aching. Can you please help, help me, please? Can you recognize that I'm a human being? 
My heart is aching through this mind voices chime, not to mention the things I've seen, only to recognize that they are not real. My heart is aching because you do me so. You just pass me up and down, to and fro. The community member took the mic from her and said, she's doing it wrong. She needs to do it right. And she started to do it. My heart is aching because I'm only seen when my mind tells me to wheel a steel. My heart is aching because I love you so. I do not want you to fear me so. This is a disorder like my friend sugar and pressure who cause you to continuously measure. My heart is aching because you label me. Help me, help me, please. Can you just give me back my dignity? And they infuse their own sense of culture and, and, and creativity into the process. Employment of the cultural therapy model in this inner city community acknowledge the sharply held hierarchical political construct within the garrison and systematically engage the internal political structure and private sector to produce a large group environment in which health education processes and myth debunking strategies were syncretically engaged with the vibrant popular culture forms of music, dance, and drama, and a rapport was established between all the stakeholders. So, as a result of this, our dear patient now is very demanding on the services and turns up for his clinic appointments and gets very, very um, involved in everything that we do. So successful outcomes was to strengthen the patriotic ties within the communities and to allow for engagement into the day-to-day -day lives of the patients while promoting mental health premises such as wellness, parenting strategies, coping with mental disorders, coping caring for the caregivers and there was resounding garrison community popularity now treating homeless in situ we look at this case now of a 44 year old african jamaican male 10 year history of schizophrenia and substance abuse he was initially a records officer for our government ministry for 12 years and became ill and due to his severity of his illness he's lost his job and became homeless because he was non-compliant with treatment and frustrated the, 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 his brother who had supported him, who wa wanted nothing more to do with him. This man has not been homeless for a short period. However, we were called when he started to wheel a steel. Our team was called when it was found that this patient was now abusive and brandishing a machete. Now the crowd from the ministry that called him gathered at a safe distance to watch the enclave of what is to come next. When we engaged with the patient, we did an assessment on the street, and then we engaged the employees who were watching to join into the discussion and openly express with the patient or the opinions, the views, the concerns, and the emotions that we all held together. Confrontation and involuntary certification was avoided, and the group decision between all members that were present the community members, the, which were the employees of the company, the patient and us, was that he could be treated on spot with injectables and allowed to stay in his makeshift dwelling until he was stable. And we would visit him twice a week for two weeks using our mobile unit. Upon our visitation, he engaged readily with the team and was more than willing to take his medication. And then he too started to become demanding and demanded that we take him to a shelter because he was tired of living outside. Now, after three months, he's back in with his family. Third case is of a visually impaired young lady, African Jamaican, 30 year history of psychosis. Lived in a dilapidated two bedroom house. Her property was used regularly as thoroughfare for gunmen from rival gangs. And she lived in a volatile inner city garrison community with long history of poverty and rival gang fear. When we engaged with the community, it was actually interrupted by gun violence. One of the members that we were engaged with got shot on that day. We had to leave, but when we returned, we embarked on reasoning with the community members, and we even inv involved the church, as Bo was saying about involving uh, traditionally. We had to involve the church and other members in the, the aspect of the reasoning, and use music, dance, and drama to engage and actively direct the garrison community members. Now, the community assisted with the renovation of the patient's house, and showed increased interest in her well-being and her mental state. And the community provided with, for her a cane. They assisted in supervising her administration of medication and kept us informed of her mental status on a regular basis. Some of the successful outcomes in this instance was the engagement of violent gangs. The community members were now more focused on taking care of the patient and relating to us than they were of reprisal violence and the mental health promotional strategies that ensued. 
Now, this issue of the garrison has been well described, and the first thing I would like to say is that the garrisons did not evolve naturalistically. They were created, and the, the birth of the garrison community was a social engineering response to scarce benefits after independence. And at the heart of this premise is violent control of a population. And 1962 is our independence, and the murder rates have been skyrocketing ever since. And when you look at the violence within the Kingston era, Geographically, you see a huge concentration of violent activities within these areas that are highlighted as garrisons. Tivoli Gardens, now I think famous or infamous, Jamaica's first politically constructed inner city garrison community. Some of the early dons, Jim Brown and Claudia Mazop. Gang warfare in Rima, federal gardens, and it really was warfare. Jamaica becoming a lawless state, a thousand odd murders. Embodiment now of Christopher Dodo Skoke, or latest saga, the president in his presidential palace. We will die for we done, Chief Dodos. And this is the incursion that the armed forces and the police had by going into Tivoli to execute the extradition order for this man. Willing to die for Dodos. And it was really a war. And what, when we have a war, it's always the people who suffer. 72 people killed in that incursion. Gets the maximum sentence while the architect of the garrison looks on only at the things that he sees, innocence and adorability. Any fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. The man himself, Dudo says, I'm guilty. Some epistemological considerations. Irving Goffman described in the total institutions that existed in mental hospitals and military bases. And what he said was, many total institutions seem to function merely as storage dump for inmates. But they usually present themselves to the public as rational organizations designed consciously as effective machines for producing a few officially avowed and officially approved ends. 1972, George Beckford, an economist, used this model successfully and applied it to the colonial plantation system. He developed theories contrasting the sociology of the total institution and the institutions of post-slave societies. And what we are suggesting is that in post-colonial Jamaica, the plantation total institution has metamorphosed into the political garrison. Maxwell Jones, in his pioneering work of the therapeutic community, has been central to the deconstruction of the total institution. The concept of the therapeutic community is central to the practice of cultural therapy. And we have applied the cultural therapy model to the community engagement, community mental health model, to assist in the dismantling of the political garrison in Jamaica. And when you look at some of the comparative characteristics, you see forced, non-engaging um, execution of legal frameworks and clinical resistance orders. And in our model, the in empowerment and inclusion and involvement of the patient and the de-escalation of resistance and confrontation with the patient. You look at the total institution model in terms of epistemology, model of control and containment. Our model really looks at group participation and flattening of the hierarchical structure. The etiological focus is mainly biological. We tend to be more social and environmental. And the therapeutic focus and focuses primarily on pharmacology. We have to be eclectic. As I was speaking with Yopa and saying, we will use whatever works. Whenever you come with a preordained model of what your ideology is, usually it doesn't work very well. And in term, instead of symptomatologically ascribing emotions, you validate the fact that the patient is fearful that we are there rather than saying that he's paranoid. <laughs> Our structure is organized in a less mechanistic way, it's more holistic and organic, and our focus is not just on the client, but on the client, the family, and the community, because the client also has a responsibility to the community as much as the community has to the client. And the empowerment is of the client and the community together. And in terms of health promotion activities, it tends to be indigenous. We teach with the patients, and in fact, we learn a lot more from the patients sometimes. And the use of creative cultural modalities is imperative. Stigma is reduced, and what we see is that we have better outcomes by using this model in terms of the social and clinical um, framework for our patients. And we can give an overview of 
all the issues and aspects of the characteristics that we compare. But until the lions have their own history and tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And we have to really look at this issue of, as my dear professor would say, medical equipoise. I hope I pronounce it right. <laughs> one love, brothers and sisters, one heart. Oh, disclosure, these are the funding agencies. <laughs> yeah?